ini. Um, but uh, remember the Linux systems and Linux systems, uh, either you have the default system which needs to be protected and good, or maybe uh, you have sensitive materials like user data. So, um, um, user data which is sensitive, uh, or even the TLS certificates which you wanted to protect. So, up to the final question, which one and how do you protect the statement? And which form of it? Like, you keep the private key, public key, PKI infrastructure, how do we keep them protected? And uh, use them together with Linux. So that's what we're going to see about. And uh, how to uh, keep them trusted and what are all the trusted things which you can use to protect so, My name is Patrick and I'm Pat. And I'm a software consulting company doing Linux and uh, software mostly. And I primarily live in Berlin. So today we can see uh, you know, about what is Linux, what is the key detection service, and what are all the key types. And uh, specifically to speak about the trusted and encrypted keys and uh, how to use them, and what are all the possible trusted sources we have in the embedded targets, something like PM trust zone, and how do we use them. So I thought I could do a demo, but actually I'm not sure about the technicality to show a video here, but otherwise I will just show up some sort of commands in the screenshot. But otherwise the materials which is uploaded in the um, link, you already have a video, you can have a look. So uh, in a nutshell, so key retention service in the kernel basically helps in a way to keep your cryptographic data, um, let's say authentication tokens and uh, what not, say the protected uh, stuff, and to catch them within the kernel. So which helps like other parts of the kernel services to use it so that you can benefit from the trusted key sources or any form of key uh, services. So for example, you have a key which is loaded into the kernel and uh, the kernel can make use of it to use it from, let's say, file system cryptography or other parts of the kernel services which technically needs the key sources itself. So that's what we're going to see and that's potentially possible with the kernel's uh, key retention services. So uh, with kernel key retention service, we, what we have is like, so there are uh, not for key, this is like more than key, what it is actually supported or helps to do it. Let's say if you try to create a key and manage it from the uh, user space, so you have a set of permissions, as like your process permissions or file permissions, you have permissions for the key. Let's say the user ID of the key itself helps in terms of controlling which is the group of process which you can access to this particular key or group of, let's say, um, files which are shared across processes. So it can benefit from that, from the kernel perspective. That's the job of the kernel key retention service, which is uh, going to help. So one other thing is uh, the lifetime of the key itself. So you can set an expiry time, and when you have a session which is expired, and then your key can be revoked or cleared from the uh, kernel key retention. So that helps in terms of how long you have um, the lifetime for that particular key material or the blob materials which you add into it. So uh, there are other types of it. Let's say, for example, process keyings, set keyings, and uh, let's say user keyings and so on. But that's not the scope of what we are going to discuss now. So our focus mostly towards the uh, trusted key source. And uh, I will stick with, let's say, next couple of slides to explain the basics about how do we use the to control uh, with some couple of commands. So in this uh, simple representation, you can say, let's say, key control is the utility, uh, which is accessing the control, key services directly to um, system calls. So for example, let's know the lib wrappers to uh, go ahead with it. So there are, uh, there is a library called libkeyutils, which provides the key control command utility as well. You can use that and invoke a set of things like adding a key uh, let's say updating the answer to a key and so the permissions and we can also get what is the key itself is I mean so it depends on the types you can say what you get out of it and how do you use it. So those are things you can do it from the user space perspective. 
the closed case perspective wants to add up a key, uh, to the kernel key ring services, uh, you can think of like other services which you can benefit from it. Uh, for example, is like the green cryptography itself. So you have a file system or the block device completely um, encrypted using the encrypt using the device mapper cryptography, and which can potentially request the key from the key ring services and use it as the plain text. Uh, to decrypt the key file system. So, I mean, like the user space doesn't need to know about the key the key, but the user space only can talk about adding the key and just maintaining the blob which is encrypted in the user space. So, which we will see in a detail. But how does it directly reflect into the hardware? Let's say Trust Zone, TPM, and other set of courses. Uh, so, so, what we're going to see in detail. Okay, so otherwise, this is in there, like, what is potentially a key uh, from the compass perspective? So, key itself contains a set of metadata, as I said before. Uh, when you create a key, it is uniquely identified with a serial number, which is called the integer. And uh, you have a description, the ASCII string, which you can potentially use it for finding it and using it for further command utilities like key control or key utils library for the system call itself. And there are other forms of like the lifetime of the key and where it is reversed and there is bitmask the permissions as well. So to control it. When you try to access a specific key but then you do not have control, kernel takes care of it saying EPERM, you do not have permission, so you can't use it something like that. So that's a group of things which is already part of the key uh, metadata information. And there are two other things. One is the key blob itself, the key material itself, and then the key type. So speaking about key types. Uh, default key types, that's the part of the key retention service, and there are additional key services which is added uh, over the evolution of like the past two, three years or four years. So, so the user, uh, which uh, log on, the key, and the key ring itself. So, this is the one which you create from the user space, and uh, the kernel maintains it uses for other purposes of the service itself. And log on, I mean, like user space wherein you can. Uh, invoke key control to create it, modify it, um, in fact, clear it or reverse the key from, uh, from the key ring altogether. But whereas the login key is basically used only within the kernel, it is never exposed to the user space. So there are other types like big key, asymmetric, and so on, I'm covering all of them here. So, and one special uh, key is uh, type is basically the key ring itself. So to simplify understanding about what is a key ring, you can think of like a directory structure. So the directory which contains, let's say, um, X number of files and which also contains another directory. So you can imagine something like that. Key ring is basically a group of keys and also it can link to another key ring. So it's just like the organization of how metadata can be put together. So that's the key ring, um, which is also a type. And uh, there are two other types which I mentioned, which is encrypted and as well as trusted. I'm going to detail it in the later slide, but it is again the symmetric key which is useful when you want to do the uh, encryption on block devices or more sensitive data which we spoke earlier. Okay, so um, before jumping into the trusted and encrypted keys, keys in the detail, um, I'll give you a simple com uh, example adding up the um, user key which is named as my user key in this um, command. So pulling it from the random number device and uh, you, what you get as an output is basically the serial number. So from there, when you say key control show, or you see uh, the key itself is like my user key identified with the uh, unique identifier, which is the serial number. So you have control over this key or using um, this serial number, you will have multiple other options like reworking, updating the permissions, and sharing across multiple processes, sessions, and so on. So where you can see in the key control store, you have like you have like a default session uh, key ring as well as user key, which is already bound to it. So the default one, which is created for every process code, you can eventually revert as well, but that's the default. Okay, so that's about how keys ring and key itself is organized. So now that um, we go into specific of what is trusted and encrypted key, the topic of what we're going to discuss now in detail. So as I said before, trusted and encrypted key, both of them is cryptographic, uh, I mean, like a symmetric key, which we want to create from the user space. And uh, it is uh, like, 
you have, we do not have access to the community altogether in the ecosystem. Only the current ecosystem gets it into the ecosystem more of the security that you in plain text or it has to go access to the community space. What you always see is the encrypted block. So when you request a block, in your space, whenever you get it as like next to the block, always encrypted. So the purpose of it is like you can store this key directly into a file system. Let's say into a ESP4 or a file system directly and use it. I mean, if, even if you have uh, another dual, uh, you can do it and uh, somebody has access to this particular key, there is no problem with it because the control of the and how it solves in a way like uh, figures out like you can know, use the same key to decrypt the whole uh, block twice or so. So, and uh, otherwise, let's say, um, the put an encrypted key. So, um, the encrypted key doesn't need to have any uh, source of trust. Basically, like you can use a cryptographic password or any other IP block to uh, encrypt it and keep it. But whereas the trusted key needs a hardware source of trust, which is, like, say, uh, a good example is TPM or a good example is the password. So, which itself like helps in storing the trusted OTP or like the key itself is encrypted using the unique material which is part of the uh, IP block. So that's the source, which is what the slide is about. So uh, the book of trust, uh, like uh, trust source specifically, when I say trust source, uh, how do you define a trust source? So trust source bound to a specific group of trust. So uh, as I said, the example could be specific hardware IP blocks to source a uh, master key. Let's say it's never been disclosed by the device, or you cannot have access to it. Only the hardware IP block have access to it. And use that as a root of trust. And uh, use it as a root of trust to encrypt or whatever you want to do on that. Let's say um, to prepare IP which is encrypted and use that key for uh, encrypting your whole root file system or the second system. So that's the root of trust. So root of trust relies on which root of trust you're going to use in the hardware perspective. And the execution isolation is one quick example I can just keep that going. Uh, so you have uh, the rich execution in one group is Linux, and you have, you have an operating system called uh, or TOS or OS, which relies on the execution isolation. So you do not really have access towards how you access how the key itself is encrypted or how the key itself is decrypted. So what you really see only is the encrypted portion and use it for user space. So the execution environment is completely isolated from so platform integrity and then it's these three points in the uh, which we're gonna repeat in every uh, part of the trust which we're gonna see now. So platform integrity is like how do we bound towards that specific hardware? Say a TPM wherein you have a platform integration register to create multiple uh, forms of key in the same way. So that's like three uh, key points which you think of create, uh, treating any form of hardware as a trust source. So when you have a SOC selection like ST2 or uh, IRASMX, so uh, so there is uh, the SAP form itself or multiple devices, so you consider these three points as a source of uh, figuring out whether it is I can act as a source of trust or it can act as a source of trust. So, um, before uh, specifically speaking about these trust sources, how it was basically uh, in let's say before five or four kernel or even two four. So, this picture represents let's say the key control utility from the user space accessing of the system call, and when you invoke the control utility for the trust source, uh, by default it was implemented in a way or tightly bound to uh, TPM only. So TPM is the only option which was available. And when you create a trusted key or let's say you create a key or a load a key, always it is bound to TPM. So we need a TPM to have a trusted source. So that is the previous thing. You know, just like the one of the restrictions was like they are even though you have multiple other trust sources like RT and other stuff, but it wasn't there. And later point of time it was extended in such a way that trusted itself is a key. Added with multiple other uh, sources of trust. Let's say TPM could be one of it, uh, or T could be, or the trust in one point of trust in this one. So, and there are a couple of other uh, things which is shown here as TPM and BCP, which is part of the I don't know, series. So, 
the way it is abstracted here is basically uh, the key uh, type that provides a set of operations, let's say, soil of soil operations and the um, key operations, uh, specific trust of key operation, which is ceiling, and ceiling and get random. So if you have a new trust source which you want to add, or near uh, new SOC with unique capability. The only thing you need to care about is adding these three functionality and register it as a trust source. So, um, probably you might be interested about adding a new key type, but uh, here in specific towards this, when you want to add a key type, uh, you want to go together with uh, an So, uh, you implement uh, APIs or set up in points here in your key type, which is basically instantiation. Uh, work here. So instantiation means when you invoke key control from the user space to add a key or uh, let's say load a key from the block, then technically you have to implement this uh, instantiation. So meaning um, key control system calls will indirectly invoke uh, your trust uh, type. Let's say if you register a type, new key type, and then you collect this from the current and the literal key type. So eventually, it would be invoking the instantiation. So other which you can say, let's say, read, read, up and read. So read would be, let's say, uh, the one called previously stored. When you say key control print to print what is the key material itself. So it would eventually invoke the read portion. So um, speaking about trusted sources, uh, so there are four different trust sources which are currently available. Which is the, uh, the first two is based on IROT and QS deposit processor and which is the deposit exploration module in the IROT and the later two is basically generate which is the PPM uh, connected with external I2C or I buses. And if your platform or the I2C is capable of, let's say, uh, having capable of trusted platform enabled, so then you can are the four different types of trust sources which is currently available and we are adding say from end to enable uh, SDN32 as a trust source and a set of other changes which are happening now. So when I say trust source, uh, I previously mentioned like a set of options, a set of options needs to be implemented which is let's say sealing it, unsealing it and getting the random number. When I say sealing it, um, so you have to uh, have let's say for example generating a way to Only for the IP block. You can visit from 
if they come to use the space or from, uh, from the different countries. So I still do want to use the VIP project itself. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So you, you can uh, have a look from the example and uh, wherein you have the city factors for implementing steel and steel and steel and steel and steel and you want to have a true random generator externally, something like PPM, or you could have a random number converter, which is basically usable together with the proper source, so then you can use this one. So right now, uh, the source of collection is a common source of collection, and the source of collection is a common source of collection. From the other perspective or other side of the consumer side of the key request, uh, which is shown here is the process and cryptography, which is the device number cryptography here. So, which request key, when it is, uh, let's say, I wanted to decrypt a portion of the file or encrypt a portion, you have a file system which is encrypted or user data which is encrypted. Uh, device number, uh, if you set it up with using the PS source, or you put it with directly the keying service to put forward to the open machine and use the set to decrypt it. So, that's the consumer side of it. Potential uses this device mapping cryptography at this point of time, but maybe there are additional trust sources as you may be talking about it at the top of the computer. So, that's an example of how DCP is organized with the architecture part of it. So, how internally the Stealing and stealing and the is into DCP. So uh, there is a, I mean, this, is a, this is all just like uh, detailed things which is already implemented, which is already implemented. So uh, here we have um, post random, as I said, you can, you can change it basically between the use. And from the steel perspective, you have um, the, the way it's handled is like um, you create a random uh, key. And encrypt that is like a block encryption key, encrypted using uh, the trusted key itself, and also the key itself is also encrypted and given to the user space. So the user space always keeps the encrypted version of this particular key. So while unsealing, the reverse happens. So decrypting the block uh, encryption key and then following with the trusted key itself. But in the uh, other services like VM cryptography, also can use, potentially use this to decrypt the file system. So that's in uh, whole organization. So I think we started with the key uh, structure, and uh, the second there is like the trusted key payload, and uh, the payload itself is having uh, entry towards the blob. So TCP uses a special form of uh, uh, form, uh, blob because um, it doesn't have any blob mechanism directly built into the hardware itself, uh, like the CAM, which is the other key block, which you see, which you will see. So in to to so handle this particular part, basically DCP uses format uh, to have a blob key, which is the blob encryption key, which we see as well. So, so, uh, so that's the payload part. The last uh, portion is the payload part, which holds the key itself. So that's an example. Let's say key, and then the trusted key portion, and then the internal structure portion of DCP itself. So, yeah, so back to the three uh, of consideration for the source of trust, which is, uh, let's say, the source of trust is basically uh, rooted to the OTP or the unique use is fused into the hardware. And the execution and isolation is uh, not directly there because, like, we don't have any block mechanisms together with DCP. And uh, to have integrity, you have, we must have hard enabled and uh, the device must be perfect. I think there was a uh, talk about you know, how, do, how do we have a very perfect enabled hub uh, from in the, in the OSS concept by Tango Trust. I mean, the device must be closed and the hub must be able to have uh, the cloud on the way for this. And uh, I, guess have, I could run it, but unfortunately, uh, there's no way to the video here. Instead, I will jump into the next version of the trusted source and show you uh, slides in the end uh, about how you actually do this, uh, like the DCP as the trusted source. So otherwise, you have the next one, which is the cap. Cryptographic accelerator module part of our algorithm with any newer SOCs, which is basically various cryptographic algorithms, and it also has blob mechanism. When you say blob mechanism, the hardware itself is capable of, let's say, you specify a certain key and it's just asked to propose the encrypted key, which blob mechanism put into the hardware itself. So you ask for it and you can probably get an encrypted blob out of it. So that's the kind of hardware support. 
And one second, this is the proof of this. So say uh, if there is a random key encrypt using the derived derived key for the ODP master key, that we can block, which is like an extreme healthy block, which is uh, disclosed at all. Like uh, it is fused or given uh, produced uh, during the OTC OTC time. So like the factor is confused as this key. And uh, basically, the idea is like say. Mm, Generate a random key and uh, encrypt using the derived key from the key and use this as a proof of trust so that like you can use it from the user space or give it as a key in uh, root of trust. So during the loading sequence, you do the block and then the you directly handle the um, description of the particular block and this currently can use the, uh, used as a trust of course. So this again, uh, how uh, can handles the this uh, about how Encryption. And when you submit a job to the uh, cache during uh, gathering, then you have to submit like the link uh, on the payload itself to encrypt, and then you get the output which is encrypted. So uh, back to the three-point summary there, like uh, through the root of trust goes to the OTP master key, so used into the SOC during the production of it. And uh, the uh, job mechanism basically isolates the execution inside the hardware itself. So the execution isolation is possible, and you must have the hardware enabled, otherwise the, uh, it would use the test key, which is, um, I mean, you don't have to do in the production. So you also have to enclose the device to have the test key there. And the next one is the PPM. So probably you have heard of it, and you probably can have this with ISO X2 or X and SPI uh, interfaces connected. So we have a root of trust basically on the storage uh, root key. So um, in summary, like this is a set of operations which you uh, execute with TPM. Uh, the TPM comes for the rest of the location part. You can get the random by sending this uh, get random command and uh, create a new key. You see, uh, basically you use uh, the create command and to load and unseal it using this command with TPM. With so you have a complete isolation within the TPM module. So, but in summary, like again, the root of trust goes to the uh, storage root key, and the execution isolation uh, offloaded completely to the IP itself. And you have transformability, like the set of configuration register where you can bound and execute uh, specific towards uh, each and every key. You can get that bounding as well at later point of time. So the platform security stays for TPM. So here, um, a small snippet about how do we use TPM here. Uh, by default, TPM would have, I think, two, uh, the key, uh, storage root key is zeros. It is by different methods. So you have to create a new key uh, and then make it persistent into the memory of uh, TPM so that you can use it. So that's the way you create it and then make it persistent so that like from the next time around you can just use this key. Um, I mean, the storage root key itself. Otherwise, it would be all zeros, right? So. Uh, you, you, you do it, and then, yeah, otherwise you can create the key as like it mentioned as the block of source. Like, I mean, previously we saw what we saw with key control command is like add as a user key, but so here it is a specific key uh, in this example. But I will show you an example of the key in a later slide. Yeah, the last and final one from the trusted source is the trust zone, uh, which runs as a completely independent operating system, that is the IPOS. And from the Linux perspective or the rich execution environment, you access it via the secure mode of the So the exception is handled in the IPOS and it would run a trusted application. So that's the uh, reference you can think of. Like, I mean, the other slide is to be saw the architecture is trusted. All the remaining stays the same uh, except the, uh, the trusted, trusted execution environment. So the T trusted source basically going to trigger the uh, secure mode of call. The other side of it is matched by the option code uh, or OPOS code. And this is actually do the seal and seal and boot random. So how, do, how does it do? So like it's, it's actually handled in the trusted uh, keys trusted application. So the trusted application which is running in the user space of OP and which is going to handle it. So how what it properly or what internally it does is basically to consume how the random number is going to use in the driver of OP or uh, which uh, Unique key that is going to use, let's say hardware unique key or so, but it depends on the private portions or the um, driver registration which is done as part of the OS itself. And back to 
here you can see in the idiom set of command the three which is uh, mentioned by the description. So the description is 32, trusted colon, ETC framework. So that's the one which is loaded in the previous uh, set. So you just set up to uh, set up with this particular key, but the cryptography used to use this uh, by requesting the keying services. And uh, yeah, you can find this file into an 64 or square process file or whichever. And inside it. The, book, the image itself is completely encrypted. So you have to use the same exact two ways to encrypt it. So cooling the mounting process of it. So yeah, that's the example. So this is a device which is, uh, like say, use case is medical device, which is, let's say, a tighter implants uh, required to check it. Uh, potentially, you probably can scratch it and uh, not able to do it. Yeah. Uh, for TPT, you can do the hands and the back foot. I think. So, so because sometimes you have to add the people who but then, like we have uh, two control hearing services for handling the active privilege. Uh, you have read write accesses and also controls. Yeah. In the hearing perspective itself, we want to emphasize to use the EPM's capability to the policy perspective. You mean? Maybe I'm missing the question here. Thank you so much. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be around.